Coming up on today's episode of Talk Avenue, a closer look at the Minneapolis City Council's budget hearing on police funding and the alarming statistics of murders against women. You're watching Talk Avenue. All right, so if you live in the Twin Cities, you already know that the city of Minneapolis's budget has been at the center of a lot of controversy, and it's all in regards to how much money they're looking to dedicate towards policing. I believe the mayor's uh, proposal for about like $1.5 billion would increase the police budget by a million dollars next year, and over 100 people showed up to a recent city council meeting to voice their concerns about that. Ooh, go people. <laughs> that makes me excited. A million dollars is a lot of money. It is. We could be is. using a million dollars towards so many other things that are necessary in the city. That's just my humble opinion. And Salah, from my understanding, you were actually there at the city council meeting. I was there, and it was absolutely a packed house. They had two overflow rooms. The entire chambers was filled with folks from across all ages. There were children, families, there were elders, there were organizers, community organizers, there were educators, there were neighbor, you know, just constituents, folks who live in different neighborhoods. Um, it was a very, very lively scene. What was the majority uh, for? Like, did they support the increase um, in funding for policing, or did the majority say that that money could be better used elsewhere? My experience is that a lot of people had proposals for how to use that money elsewhere. Um, I might be biased as an organizer, <laughs> but I feel like a lot of folks, regardless if it was social justice or racial equity, some folks it was affordable housing, some folks it was environmental um, things. I think the overall consensus was, um, what is the conversation around folks experience already with policing. And are we taking that into account when we're thinking about also like the factors that create um, environments where crime can occur, where poverty yes. occurs, right? And how that perpetuates the presence of police officers and their relationships with folks in communities who are low income or um, you know, communities of folks, of people of color or oppressed peoples. Yeah. Well, so. I feel like in other cities, the same size, um, and this is the argument that the chief of police has made, mm -hmm. that there are more police officers in cities of the same size. And so that's why they're asking for additional funding so that they can um, better staff their department. However, I think that in recent years, we have seen so many fatal police shootings mm -hmm. that that is why we're seeing this outpouring of people saying we don't need more officers. Um, and, and so, I, you know, I don't know if it's a matter of training, of them better training police officers um, or them simply taking that money and doing some type of, you know, mental health um, service program for the community. Because I think at least two of the situations that happened in Minneapolis recently were, um, you know, police calls mm -hmm. or police responding to calls of someone who was having a mental health issue right. and then that, that person ending up dead. And so how do we as a community, you know, um, feel when we're calling for help and then right. instead of getting help, now we have to plan a funeral. Oh, a lot of us don't call, for one. I know that's probably like my last resort in reality yeah. because a lot of times it can be a worse off situation depending upon what it is. Um, but I'm, I always think back to the broken window theory, mm -hmm. um, which is you know where they say, well, if you have vacant houses and things like that, you're more likely to see elevated levels of crime if you have like those, you know, like vacant vacancies. And so it's like, okay, instead of just throwing police at a crime problem, and we know that there are so many different factors that come into play um, within communities and neighborhoods Absolutely. that create, like you were saying, like an environment for right. crime to happen. Poverty is a huge piece of that, I think. Um, and so if we were to put it into, um, I think, housing, you know, and that's just, that's kind of my thing, but it's one of those basic needs where we know that our city's at a vacancy rate of less than 5%. We know that the homeless population is growing daily mm -hmm. and people are in uh, desperate places. Um, and, so, and not to excuse the violence that happens, but, but really looking at it from a holistic viewpoint rather than just saying, oh, there's crime, 
let's just throw police at it because that hasn't worked right. ever. I, I don't think it's ever worked, yeah. really, especially in in um, communities of color. Absolutely. So some irony, there is a coalition of folks, Reclaim the Black, um, who came specifically, lots of members with testimony about um, they're asking for the city to um, divest 5% of the Minneapolis Police Department's budget into social um, justice and racial economic programming or social services and things of that nature, which include services for folks who are suffering from domestic violence, services for folks who need support in immigrants' rights, services for folks who need support in getting affordable housing. And these very things, which, right, housing is a basic right, like food, clothing, shelter, like right. a place to live, are sometimes the things that folks are going without, again, that create an environment for crime to occur, um, or create environment for hostility, for stress, and for mental illness. Mm -hmm. And so what they're asking is, they're saying we this isn't like mutually exclusive, right? Like what we're asking for isn't in a vacuum that we want the money to be available for folks who need the services so we're not ending up in situations with police officers who are clearly, quite frankly, being asked to do things that are not in their caliber, right? Or not in their professional Correct. right realm of, of duties, which I'm sure is probably stressful for them as well when we have professionals whose whole work it is to support people in crisis and in mm -hmm. mental health who could be doing that work and preventing these greater, like, terrible things yeah. from happening to people. And so that's the irony of like, are we, are we in a conversation that's a circular conversation in order to just prove what our views are or are we really trying to elevate right. what we're trying to do and the work that needs to be done and the support services that need to be there to make things better. Well, I think that's the one beautiful thing that we can acknowledge out of this is at least people are coming to the table this time around and they are voicing their opinions regardless of where they stand on the issues. Um, in the past, there have been community engagement meetings and, and public hearings that no one attends and then the city council um, is or the commissioners are left to make a decision on their own and that's not how the process is supposed to work. These uh, government procedures, um, and, and, and councils are supposed to serve the community. And if we're not speaking out about what we want or what we think is important, then they're basically making these decisions based on their own beliefs and their own values. So the one thing I'm happy about is that so many people are coming forward to speak on the issue, but at the same time, we have to trust that the system in place is gonna work and that um, the, the city council members are actually going to hear the voices of the people and not the voices of who they want to hear, but hear the voices of the majority and make a decision based on that. Right. I will say this lastly, because I think it hits on your point in terms of folks showing up in the space and people getting more engaged, is that there are several new city council members who ran on racial equity mm -hmm. platforms Absolutely. who were elected by a lot of these activists, organizers, working class people. So these are folks who have not only relationships as constituents, but have relationships as community members, as comrades, who are showing up um, to make sure that these folks are being accountable for the things that they said that they wanted to do and they wanted to change. So the beauty in that is that they're now bringing these relationships in as opposed to trying to develop them after the fact, right? right. After they're yep. in the seat, now they're talking to community. A lot of these folks have been in community, in spaces, in arts, in all kinds of sectors, connecting with folks, but also right? The other side of that coin is that that means that folks are going to continuously show up. They know that this is like long-term work um, and that showing up at City Hall is really just part of the process. Yeah, mm -hmm. yep. definitely. So we'll see if they hold their, their word on what they said that they were going to do or are they just going to conform to the status quo? We'll see. As we've seen in the past. <laughs> well, um, if you watch the Today Show, you probably heard a recent report that came out about um, women who are murdered. Uh, unfortunately, home is actually the most dangerous place mm -hmm. for a woman. The UN report says that although men are most likely to be the victims of homicide, women are far more likely to be killed by someone they know and are most likely to be killed at home. They even do a 
specific report for Minnesota each year. It's called the Femicide Report. Mm -hmm. And 90% of women who are murdered are murdered by either their spouse or their former spouse. And uh, when it comes to men, 80 to 90% of men who are murdered are murdered by a stranger. Wow. I know I first discovered these stati statistics about um, two years ago, and I was just alarmed um, to find that 90%, 90% of women who are murdered are murdered by someone that they have said, I love you to. You know, it's just really disheartening. Yeah, it's, and scary. And right along with that statistic, which I didn't know, um, but I did know that 90% of women who are in prison for murder are in prison for murdering mm -hmm. the person who was had been abusing them, mm -hmm. their abuser. So it's like, literally, sometimes a relationship can be a be killed, kill or be killed situation. And that is terrifying. And it's something that touches close to home for me. I know that that's for sure. Mm -hmm. On um, like on a personal level, knowing someone who has gone through that, losing someone to domestic violence from someone who they said that I love you to is mind blowing. Yeah. And then to know that 90%, you know what I mean? It's mm -hmm. like, ooh, something's out of balance here. We're not looking at something right. in the right way. It's it's that's the only thing that I can think of. I don't understand how it gets to be that way. Well, and I think when we look at the bigger culture of America and, you know, what is it, you know, we have to, we have to break down what is it that we're doing in our society, our culture that's perpetuating this type of violence. Mm -hmm. um, my mother's a survivor, I'm a survivor, and I have three daughters. And so for me, you know, when I initially saw these statistics, I decided I wanted to do something to build awareness around them because usually when you say the word femicide, no one has heard of it. Right. So I'm working on a documentary to try to build awareness on these statistics, but um, just as, as a mother of three daughters who have to go out in this world and will form relationships and hoping and praying that those relationships are healthy relationships, I'm, I'm asking myself, okay, mm -hmm. is building awareness enough? What is it about our, our greater culture that is perpetuating this, this cycle of violence? Mm -hmm. I think it's heavy. You know, there is a whole movement around um, feminism, I guess, which, but it is not, we're not talking about femicide specifically. And I never even, I have never even heard that term before. So um, I, I don't know. I don't think that just the awareness is enough. I, I, you know, really practicing um, self-esteem building with young girls and young, and young men too, you know, um, because I think that it might be where some of that anger comes from, right? Really looking into what creates a toxic relationship. And it's all of these different things that come from our community, even the things that we talk about with like stress and having access to housing and all these things that put you in a place where you're stressed out, your mental um, capacity is like waning, you know what I'm saying? It's, it, we, we really are set up in a very toxic environment which trickles through every aspect of our lives, including our relationships. Mm. Um, it's heavy, it's heavy. I am also a member of a family of, full of survivors, um, and I had no idea about the Femicide Report, um, which is put together by the Minnesota Coalition of Battered Women. I was reading it recently, and it was very, very difficult to get through. Um, I do appreciate the naming of victims. Um, the stats were overwhelming, and just to give like a hyper-local kind of idea, some of the things that they talked about. So last year alone, at least 19 women died from domestic violence. 79% um, of those women, it was from a recent or a former partner. 53% of those victims were shot, um, and it's up 3% from the last two years between 2015 and 2017. 42% um, of those cases there was a history of violence already present. And so, and we got to think about too with these reports, we're only talking about what is reported, right? right? And I think we know that there's a tremendous amount of domestic violence that isn't reported, and I think we can think about that in its relationship also to sexual violence and sexual assault and how many women uh, come forward because I don't think that those things are mutually exclusive. And being able to leave and escape a violent situation is a safety issue, and I don't think that we talk about it. I think we whisper mm -hmm. about it, mm -hmm. um, but I don't think we 
want to name it because I, I do think that culturally that we perpetuate often ideas and values that may seem benign, right? So they're like this macro level kind of gender roles and who's supposed to do what, and um, but that really permeate like our everyday way of being and how we treat each other yeah. and how we expect each other to show up. And I, yeah, I mean, these, these kinds of reports I think are super critical and super important. And the fact that I had no idea and I know other folks who, were, who I introduced it to, and they were like, I had no idea that mm -hmm. we do a report. And it's very extensive. It is. Absolutely extensive. worth the read. You know, it makes me think of uh, Natalie Pollard. I don't know if you guys heard of her case. She recently, um, her conviction was overturned. She had a history of domestic violence with her partner, and she ended up killing him in self-defense. However, when she initially was charged or arrested, um, they found her guilty, so she was supposed to, you know, go to jail, and she did go to jail. Um, her kids were taken from her. She spent some time in jail, but th she had some legal advocates who were able to advocate on her behalf and on behalf of, like, the greater cause of domestic violence mm -hmm. and survivors in general, and they were able to get her sentence um, overturned and get her, her conviction, you know, null and void. And so now she's back in society here in the cities and she has custody of her children. Um, she's spoken out about it, you know, a few times on the news. But, you know, it's, I think small victories like that and, and knowing that there are advocates out there who are paying attention to these types of cases, mm -hmm. but it's not just I mean, we, we have to acknowledge the women who are, who are murdered, especially those who have had uh, people with a history of abuse, mm -hmm. because why is it that they're kind of just getting the slap on the wrist, you know? So um, I know one of the cases in the femicide report, you know, the young man ended up killing his girlfriend, her father, and then himself. And he had been arrested four or five times mm -hmm. within the last six months for domestic violence. So you're just getting a slap on the wrist, nothing's really happening, you're getting released, access to firearms, and then something like this happens, and now we want to do something about it. Or in the case of like Natalie Polar, where you know she had this history of domestic violence, mm -hmm. and then she's defending herself, and you said 90% of women are ending up incarcerated. So at what point, um, you know, we have a system uh, that intervenes on so many other levels, at what point do we have a system that's going to intervene in, in this regard and create better protections for women across the board? Yeah, this always brings me back to why it is important to um, pay attention to who is getting in office, who are making our laws, and forever, there were no women that were at the table at right, all. Right, right. Right, and I think that that's probably why, um, why we see some of those things, uh, because maybe they aren't thinking about it from that standpoint. I mean, just America as a whole being predominantly from, like, created for white men. Hmm. Um, it's, it seems like so much work that has to be done just for those little things. And when I think about some things as individual and specific as Natalie, um, what does her life from here on out look like? Mm -hmm. Yes, that was a win, um, but does that exclude her from the trauma mm -hmm. that she's gone mm -hmm. through? Mm -hmm. No, does that exclude her children from the trauma that she's gone through? Um, even just like post-traumatic stress, right? If she's living here and they're talking about, look, let's throw more police on the street, you know what I mean? And her have being, going to prison and dealing with all of that, I'm sure that that wasn't a pleasant experience and I'm sure that they weren't holding her hand like, mm -hmm. okay, well, we understand you were getting beat up all these years. No, they were treating her like she murdered somebody, you know? And so how do all these things play together into what we have as a whole right now? Um, and, and what does that mean for our neighbors? What does that mean for our sisters and how common is it really? Um, and what you were saying, Salah, about all of the domestic violence that happens before like the actual murder mm -hmm. itself yep. and how common are those things way more common probably than people actually losing mm -hmm. their lives yep. and it's become so normalized even between friends I've seen it where it's like oh that's the one friend whose boyfriend we all kind of know mm -hmm. not okay you know and I don't I, I'm not exactly sure how we 
um, really address that. And I know that it's been conversation between other women in the community, like what do we do when we know that one of our friends is in a, in a violent situation? How do we respond? What's the right way to mm -hmm. do this? Yeah, and it's difficult because a lot of times you don't want to overstep your boundaries with that person. And mm -hmm. if they're stuck in that cycle of forgiving and going back and, you know, you want to intervene and, and you kind of want to rescue them from that. But if they don't, if they don't want to leave, if they're not ready to leave, ultimately you can't force them. And so it's walking um, on thin ice to try to deal with it and support them and, and then not get hurt yourself because uh, in, in some of these cases we do see that the perpetrator not only harms uh, the person that they're with but then also harms their relatives or their children and then a lot of times harms themselves. I think to add to that, a crucial piece that's missing is education around domestic violence. Um, I think it's a public health issue as much as it is like a criminal justice or you know that particular kind of issue. I think it's really important for folks to understand um, and see this as a, a um, I don't want to say a disease, but like as a it's more complex, right? And we know, I think statistically too, that often these murders are triggered when partners try to leave the mm -hmm. situation. Um, and that this violence, right, has permeated this relationship. We know that there's a history of violence, um, but then somehow somebody still ends up losing their life at the end. And it's often when, when their partner tries to leave, the person who's being abused. So I think, getting really clear on education and like how to support somebody who's in a relationship like that, um, I think would help to what you're speaking to in terms of like, how do we talk to our friends about it? How do we support them? How do we not shame them, right? How do we create more outs than, um, as opposed to like creating spaces where folks feel like they need to isolate more mm -hmm. or where they feel shame? Um, and understanding like there are some really some psychological things that are tied to that that need to be worked through and processed, that there's grief involved in that process. It needs to be worked through, right? Mm -hmm. That like you were saying earlier, that this is somebody that you love and not a stranger, which adds a whole level yeah. of complexity. Um, children add a level of complexity. Um, parents, in-laws, you know, all of those things I think in relationships add some complexity and I think uh, we could use more absolutely more advocacy, more education, and more opportunities where folks feel supported and safe telling their truth. Agreed. And I think, Danielle, what you were touching on from a, a more legal level and looking at the system that's designed, I think that uh, we often talk about how laws uh, disproportionately affect communities of color, mm -hmm. but I think often as women, we kind of shy away from how it disproportionately affects us as women. Mm -hmm. um, and so just kind of even looking at that and saying, we need to, to go deal with our, our legislators and we need to lobby to get certain things in place. I know some cities have created earned sick and safe time, which can now be used for dealing with issues of domestic violence. Because if you are trying to leave, mm -hmm. there's gonna be a transition period. Right. And if you're financially dependent on this person, there's gonna be a huge transition period. And then, so as you said, if you have children, then you're dealing with custody yeah. issues. Yep. And so there are all of these factors mm -hmm. to take into consideration when someone trying to leave a violent, toxic relationship. And um, earn sick and safe time is the least that our employers could offer right. to people who are dealing with issues of domestic violence. Absolutely. Whereas most employers are turning their cheek and saying, it's not my problem, I need you here at nine o'clock. Right. Well, if I'm dead, right. <laughs> can't be there at nine o'clock. Right. <laughs> you know, so at, at some point the system has to be um, it has to pivot from being so much about profit, 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 and, and employers and, and the greater system even beyond the businesses have to care about the people who are, who are driving it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we, um, we do have a message from one of our viewers. She wrote to us from Facebook, so I'll read to you what she wrote. She said, ladies, I have been seeing this guy for a few months and we are official, but we decided not to go public for a while. 
we are both nervous about social media because sometimes when you go on social media, it can hurt the relationship. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me wrong. We are both very happy and have told close friends and family, but I need to know what is good. What is a good time to go public with your relationship on social media? Good question. Mm. What do you guys think? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I don't know. I guess I you'd have to ask, like, what role social media plays in your life. Like, yes. for some folks who spend a lot of time on social media, um, like, it's really important to them when things are presented and how and whoever their audience is, right? Could be extended family members, could be friends, it could be professional. Um, and so I think if you, your level of investment might also determine when you want to share the information and who your audience is. Um, but then for some folks, it might be more whimsical. You know, it's kind of like we're secure in what we're doing, but it's cool to let people know because then your friends are like, oh, y'all are <laughs> look cute. Hey, babe. You know, that sort of thing. So mm -hmm. depends. Yeah, I think it's a personal thing. Um, I think that there are some people, depending upon who they are, that don't want social media knowing anything about what's mm -hmm. going on with them because sometimes that just leaves an open window for people to... Um, come at your relationship, for, I guess for lack of better words, you know, misery loves company, y'all, and it'd be all over Facebook. So um, <laughs> I, I would say what's best for you and your partner, you know, probably something that you talk about like everything else and decide together and what's right for one couple is not going to be right, right for the next i hate that we even have to talk about social media <laughs> at this capacity that right. social media has become such a social norm that this is even a thing but it is a thing it really is and it, it does depend if you use social media for professional reasons or if you use it more for just connecting with your friends because let me tell you if you use it professionally i've been in situations where I, I thought this was like the end all be all relationship and I put it out there. And then that's embarrassing to kind of like have to retract. Just kidding, and then Facebook. do you do you talk about the breakup on, <laughs> on Facebook? Yeah, that's what or that's, that's do that's you just for. delete all the pictures <laughs> and all the posts that involve that person right. and just never mention that person again? You gotta send a follow um, up to all your <laughs> friends. Like, okay, I know I posted this a while back, hey, but fools. um <laughs> yes, over, and so... So whatever decision you make, I, I do think that it is wise to be responsible about it, to talk about it, to agree to doing it together. Um, but if you're kind of having those doubts, I think that um, just give it more time. And it, 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 when it's right, I think it would just naturally, yeah. you know, it would naturally come out. Yeah. yeah, and maybe on Facebook before Twitter, who knows? You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all we have time for this week. Thank you so much for joining us. We hope to see you next week.